I want to start out um, a little bit different. I appreciate Elder Mark's introduction. He is always so kind. Um, and as I've told you before, I don't preach, I teach. So I'm not a preacher. Um, but I want us to, I know there are a number of you here who are dealing with illness and malignancy and need for a kidney and so forth. But um, I'd like for us just for a moment to pray for, for Brian, my dear friend Brian. Uh, he's been in the hospital now for 11, 12 days and he's given me permission. He, he's very shy about this, but he's given me permission to, to ask for uh, prayer. But he needs to have something happen on the right side of his brain. He's had these screws placed in his skull uh, a very taxing neurological procedure and uh, kind of a last ditch effort. And he needs to have a seizure on his right side and he hadn't had one. He's had him on the left side. So they can track this with the electrodes and then know how to destroy that tissue very, in a very specific fashion. And his faith's being tested. But this man uh, puts me to shame. He has come a long way. And he's living the life of Christ because he's allowed him to fill, Holy Spirit to fill him. As a matter of fact, in, in my book, Simmering Anger, Smoldering Rage, the emotion that is killing our world that I'll tell you about in a minute, uh, there's a testimony in there that you'll uh, recognize. But would you just bow with me right now? And I, I want to ask you over the next week to please every single day pray for Brian. Pray for Brian that um, God's will will be done and that healing will occur and this um, process will come to completion. Lord, I lift up Brian to you right now in Jesus' name. I pray that you would touch his body from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. You know his brain, Lord. You know the mapping of his brain, and only you know how to make this seizure happen on the right side, and only you know how to track that elect those electrical impulses and enable the neurosurgeons to be able to precisely destroy abnormal tissue and let him be disease free. So we trust you to do this. We believe that you can do this. If you can heal the blind and restore hearing to the deaf and raise the dead, you can heal Brian. And so we trust you to do this and we ask you to do it and believe you're going to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. So. Thank you for that. Um, you all have a little handout on your seats. Uh, probably you're sitting on it. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to this a little bit later, but if you need to take any notes, you can take them on the back. Um, but this is an acronym that we'll, we'll get to a little bit later in the message. Um, they were going to project the, the covers of two books, um, a few months ago, I spoke on On the Way, Ministering in the Moment, a book I wrote with uh, my son, Neil, and uh, both the books will be coming out in, uh, in about two weeks uh, from the publisher. And Pastor Stephanie asked me if I would speak from Simmering Anger, Smoldering Rage today. Um, and as, as Mark said, it's just a topic you, you don't hear a lot of because we all are dealing with anger and who wants to talk about something you're dealing with yourself. So um, we don't hear a lot of pastors talking about anger. Uh, he had you raise your hands um, and all of you raised your hands. And I was the first. We deal with anger. Okay. So I'm going to 
talk with you today, not to you. When you talk to somebody, it's because maybe you have a little more experience, maybe you've come through something, but when you talk with people, it's because you're involved in the same process. So I'm not, I'm not separate from you, okay? This is not me up here and you down there. We're all on the same level with this. We're going to talk about what anger is. I'm telling you up front what we're going to talk about, and then I'll tell you. What anger is, we're going to talk about why we become anger, angry. And surprisingly, I'm going to give you some biblical examples of anger. One of the main points of the book and the main emphases today is to deal with your anger and not repress your anger. What so many of us do is we repress it, and we're going to try to re help you resolve that today. And then uh, we'll finish with the steps for, for resolving it. Um, and I have a, a kind of a special emphasis for those of you who are parents, um, any children in the audience, uh, young people, uh, we're, we're going to specifically address dealing with anger uh, at that age. To begin with, you need to understand that anger is a normal emotion. So if you were taught as a child, don't you ever be angry, or if you have come to believe, I shouldn't be angry, you're you're talking about not doing something that is normal. It's normal to become angry. It's a normal emotion. It's a part of the fight or flight reflex. Back in cavemen days, animal approaches, you either stand there with a club and battle it out or you run for your life. And anger was developed by God to enable us to be protected from harm and danger. When our self-esteem, our self-worth, our physical well-being is threatened, then we either get angry and battle it out or we say, I, I need to get out of here. And we're going to talk about the process of being able to deal with that. You also need to understand that you cannot be angry and joyful at the same time. It's an impossibility. How do I know that? Well, um, can you be hungry and full at the same time? No. And the reason for that is there's a place in the brain called the satiety center. And hunger and satiety, fullness, come from the same place in your brain. So you can't have, you can't do both. The same thing is true with anger and joy. They come out of the same area of your brain. And one of the things I want you to get today is if you are angry all the time, you are sapping joy from your life. It is not the way God wants you to live. And believe me, I've been angry and I've had my joy sapped at times. I don't want that for you. So we're going to talk about how to deal with that from a physiologic standpoint. Anger is not a sin. Now, anger can stimulate sin if it turns into aggression and rage. So the root anger can become sin. I'm not saying it's not, but please don't leave here today saying David Hager said that if I get angry, I'm sinning. I'm not. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, I'm assuming, yeah, we don't have that anymore. I'm glad I wrote my scriptures down, so. <laughs> uh, from the, this is from the Living Bible. If you are angry, don't sin by nursing your grudge. This is the primary scripture that's used in dealing with anger from a biblical perspective. If you are angry, don't sin by nursing your grudge. Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. Get over it quickly. God's Word speaking this to us. Don't let the sun go down still angry. Get over it quickly. For when you are angry, you give a mighty foothold to whom? You give a mighty foothold to the devil. 
Satan loves for us to be angry. The Word instructs us to deal with our anger, not nurture it, not suppress it, not repress it. Don't let your anger turn into aggression. Folks, we live in an angry society. I mean, you can't drive down the road and somebody whipping in front of you and putting their hand out the window and making signs or yelling or... We live in an angry world. That's what our book is all about. The emotion that is killing our world. And, and it's not just here. It's not just at Bethel. It's not just in Lexington, not in Kentucky. It's around the world. Believe me, we travel. And we find anger everywhere. There have been 484 mass shootings in the United States in the first eight months of 2023. Do you know what a mass shooting is? It's where four or more people are killed, not including the perpetrator. There have been 484 mass shootings in the first eight months. That's two per day. There have been 3,791 homicides in the United States in the first six months of this year. I became acutely aware, as I shared with you right from this platform, because it was, it was always something distant from me, the anger, the rage, the killing, the mass shootings. But when the shooting occurred at the Covenant School in Nashville, all of a sudden, two of our grandchildren attending there, it became real. Yeah. We became frightened. For an hour, we didn't know where our now five-year-old little boy Henry was. And so it, it's out there, and anger motivated that shooting. There have been 268,000 robberies in the United States in 2022. There have been 463,000 rapes in the United States each year. One sixth of all women have either been raped or sexually assaulted in the United States. Friends, that's sad. Yeah. It's sad. My heart goes out to every woman who's had to experience that type of victimization. All that's from the Bureau of Vital Statistics. So when I began to read about these numbers, I said, where, where better to go to try to get some information than to interview some prisoners? And so we went and we, we interviewed some prisoners. Almost 100% of them had been abused emotionally, physically, or sexually in their lives. Most isolated from society, as you'll hear me say again later, one of the things that we do in anger is we isolate. One of the worst things we could do, but we do it. They blamed others for their emotion of anger. Most of them lacked boundaries for their behavior. Many of them were very unforgiving. They had not forgiven perpetrators in their life. And there was a high level of racial prejudice. Most indicated that they repressed their anger. They freely admit, I, I, I became angry, but then all of a sudden this anger would explode and I would do something violent. I would commit a crime. The Journal of Forensic Sciences from in an article last year, quote, serious mental illness is not a major factor in most mass shootings. Underlying anger is. So we, we blame it all on mental illness. We say if we could just get hold of the mental illness in our country, but it's this underlying, seething, surging anger that we have to deal with. Let me give you some biblical examples of, of anger just to let you know that we're no different than what the biblical examples show. Adam and Eve, from the very beginning, Adam became angry with Eve because Eve was seduced by the tempter and ate the fruit and then got him to, to eat it. Cain became angry with Abel because 
God showed favoritism toward Abel for his offering to him. It was more pleasing. So Cain killed his brother in anger. Abraham became angry. It took 25 years for God to fulfill his promise that he had made to him that you're going to have a son. Sarah got tired. She had even laughed at the angel who said, you're going to have a child in your old age. And so ultimately she tells Abraham, take Hagar, Hagar, not Hagar, Hagar, my, uh, my maidservant, and, and sleep with her. And she gives birth to a male son, which is what Abraham wanted, not willing to, to wait longer. She was angry. 25 years later, she gets pregnant and has Isaac. But out of Hagar Ishmael comes the Arab nation. Out of Sarah Isaac comes the Jewish nation. Conflict, anger, rage. Moses became angry with the Israelites because they complained all the time. Give me this, give me that, give me quail, give me manna, give me water. And so he, uh, his level of patience was really tested. In Exodus 17, God told Moses to strike the rock at Mount Horeb, and water came forth, and it poured forth, and the people had water. But then again, the people started complaining later, we still don't have any water. You brought us out here to die of thirst. And in Numbers 20, God told Moses to do what? Speak to the rock. This was at Meribah. But Moses was angry with the people, and he was angry with all that was going on, and so he physically strikes the rock again, and water comes out. But God was upset with Moses because he didn't follow his lead, and he wasn't allowed to enter into the promised land. David became angry. In the season when kings should go out to war, what did he do? He sat on his duff at home and looking over the balcony sees something that he shouldn't see and sleeps with Bathsheba. But then in order to try to cover it up, this man after God's own heart, a man that we, we want to live like, calls Uriah from the front and tells him to sleep with his wife so it'll appear that He's the father of the child she's pregnant with, and he won't do it. And David becomes angry and sends him to the front, and he's killed, and you know the rest of the story. Anger. Paul was angry, the apostle Paul. He was killing Christians, killing Jews, and on his way to Damascus, Jesus appears to him, why are you persecuting me? And Paul's anger was supernaturally transformed. He had a supernatural transformation of his lifestyle. Pastor's been teaching, Elder Mark's been teaching about supernatural lifestyle. It requires a work of Holy Spirit, a work of Jesus to deal with the anger in our lives. What about God's anger? God's anger was usually initiated by sin and rebellion from his people. It was always, an initiate, was always initiated in an effort actually to restore his people. He resolved his anger by redeeming. He resolved his anger by dealing with it. He was always willing to forgive and forget. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I am the one who forgives your sin and remembers them no more. He has a supernatural capacity to forget our sin even when he is upset with us. In Leviticus 26, in the Living Bible, it says, and if you still won't listen to me or obey me, then I will let loose my great anger and send you seven times greater punishment for your sins. God has anger. Our creator expressed anger. God was angry with the leaders of Israel for their sins in 2 Kings. Jehoahaz began a 17-year reign over Israel during the 23rd year of the reign of King Joash of Judah. 
But he was an evil king, and he followed the wicked paths of Jeroboam, who had caused Israel to sin. So the Lord was very, very angry with Israel. And he continually allowed King Haziel of Syria and his son Ben-Hadid to conquer them. But Jehoahaz prayed for the Lord's help, and the Lord listened. Okay, remember the word listen. And the Lord saw how terribly they were treated. He listened and saw his anger resolved, and he raised up leaders among the Israelis to rescue them from the tyranny of the Syrians. God redeemed his people in spite of his anger toward them because he listened and he saw. What about Jesus? Jesus become angry? The sinless Lamb of God? Well, in Matthew 21, it says Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. John 2 actually says he weaved cords with a whip in doing that. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Jesus became angry. Jesus took leather straps and took the time to weave a whip together. It wasn't just laying there. It says in John 2, he weaved the leather into a whip. That's going to be an important part of our resolution process. I want you to remember that, that Jesus took time to do something with his hands. And he took out his anger on the money changers' tables, and he drove the livestock out, but he didn't hit anyone. He didn't strike anyone down, which he had the power to do. He didn't destroy human life. He drove what was foreign to God out of the temple. And he acted and then immediately went back to doing what he did, which was redeeming the world. It, he left the temple and went out. We, say, we call that righteous indignation. It's kind of a nice word to excuse our anger. I've used that myself many times. Oh, I'm righteously indignant. No, I'm frankly angry. So um, I think Jesus was angry. I think he was angry as a hornet. And he displayed his anger, however, in a controlled fashion. Shortly after that, Jesus became angry again. He was with the disciples, um, and they were walking along the road, and he came to a fig tree, and he was hungry, and he reached up, and there were no figs, even though it was out of season. And Jesus became angry, and he cursed the fig tree. And the fig tree did what? It died spontaneously, and the disciples were amazed. Now, there are two meanings for the figs on the fig tree, and uh, Elder Mark can explain this in more detail, but it was Jesus was angry because he could, didn't give food, but also the fig tree may have represented Israel and the fact that God had empowered them, had given them fruit, and they hadn't used it correctly. Jesus became angry. Jesus acted on his anger and he did not allow his anger to simmer. Amen. He didn't repress it. He didn't put it back there and say, well, I'll, I'll come back to this later. No, he dealt with it. We're going to talk today about dealing with our anger. Why do we become anger, angry? Persistent anger is a symptom of deep-seated root issues. It's a re a reaction as all our other addictive behaviors to rejection, abandonment, abuse, neglect, bullying, unmet expectation, or parental wounds. Resentment toward those who inflicted the wounds is often repressed and allowed to simmer. It may also be resentment that you have toward an institution or an organization that, that you support and somebody has attacked it. And we develop this feeling inside that somebody has to pay for my anger. 
I have to be able to get back at someone. Signs of anger include isolation, remember that, insecurity, paranoia, depression, lack of boundaries, people who speak in a loud voice. You know the people that you, you hear talking over everybody else? Studies show that there's often underlying anger within, a desire to get back at others, being easily irritated, exhibiting passive-aggressive behavior not being joyful people. When my, uh, one of my, our sons was 12 years old, he played Little League Baseball, and um, I would go to all the Little League games, and there was one of the players on his team that he was always yelling at the other kids on his team. None of them could do anything right. He was yelling at the manager. I mean, I was amazed at some of the things he said directly to this, this, their coach. And he was just, all this stuff coming out, and I, I just felt sorry for the kid. And one day I went on a Saturday morning to the game, and all of a sudden over to my right, I hear this male adult screaming at the umpire for balls and strikes and yelling at the manager because his, his son wasn't playing in right field and he wanted him in right field. And then yelling at his kid, his own child, because he struck out. How horrible are you? Well, this was that kid's father. He had seen in the home anger exhibited, heard it in the stands, and he was angry himself. So when we example anger, Often we will see anger, angry. James, anger. James 4 says, where do you think all these appalling wars and quarrels come from? Do you think they just happen? Think again. They come about because you want your own way and fight for it deep inside yourselves where you repress it. You lust for what you don't have and are willing to kill to get it. You want what isn't yours and will risk violence to get your hands on it. You wouldn't think of just asking God for it, would you? And why not? Because you know you'd be asking for what you have no right to. You're spoiled children, each wanting your own way. You're cheating on God. If all you want is your own way, flirting with the world every chance you get, you end up being enemies of God and His way. And do you suppose that he doesn't care? The proverb has it that he's a fiercely jealous lover. And what he gives in love is far better than anything else you will find anywhere. It's common knowledge that God goes against the willful proud. God gives grace to the willing humble. The other thing you need to know about anger is anger can be addictive. So when we become angry, serotonin and dopamine are released from the brain and from the adrenal gland. Same thing that happens when you are smoking pot, doing drugs, smoking cigarettes, drinking too much. You get this temporary thrill, viewing pornography. You get a temporary high. And that becomes addictive because you want it feels good temporarily. And so with anger, you want to go back and, and stimulate that again. You want that dopamine high to occur again. How do we deal with our anger? Let's move on to that. Number one, you must admit you're angry. You all admitted you were angry this morning. So you must admit that you get angry. If you deny it, then you're denying truth. We must identify the root issues that lie behind our anger. Why our anger? Why do we get angry? You have to identify. Was I abused? Was I rejected? Do I have unmet expectations? Do I have parental wounds? What has happened to me? Was I sexually assaulted? That has caused me to be angry inside. We need to recognize, I need to recognize, I'm powerless to do anything about this on my own. We're powerless to deal with this on our own. We're not equipped. We need God's help. Romans 12, 2, 
men in my group will tell you, <laughs> he reads this every week. We're getting sick of it. But uh, it is my favorite, one of my favorite verses. This is from the Message Translation. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. That's what happens with anger. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. NIV says he will renew your mind. Do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And Romans 8, 6 says, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. That peace, that joy, that life that we want to, to experience can only come from the indwelling presence of Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit severs synapses. Holy Spirit renews joy and takes away anger. But you've got to allow that to happen in your life. So you've got to realize you're powerless on your own. You need Holy Spirit. And then we need to establish boundaries for our behavior. Somebody doesn't have to pay for everything bad that's happened to you. You need to deal with that. Romans 12, 19 through 21 in the Passion Translation says, Beloved, don't be obsessed with taking revenge. Beloved, don't be obsessed with taking revenge. But leave that to God's righteous justice. For the scriptures say, if you don't take justice in your own hands, I will release justice for you, says the Lord. And if your enemy is hungry, buy him lunch. Win him over with kindness. For your surprise, surprising generosity will awaken his conscience, and God will reward you with favor. Never let evil defeat you, but defeat evil with good. Amen. Don't let anger defeat you, defeat anger with good. Finally, it is essential to establish self-control over our actions. Amen. Out of control is out of sync with God. Out of control, hope you're writing, is out of sync with God. Galatians 5, uh, the fruit of the Spirit, the result of His presence within us is the amplified version is love, unselfish concern for others, joy, inner peace, patience, not the ability to wait, but how we act while waiting, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law. God wants us to be self-controlled individuals. Only Holy Spirit can enable me to be self-controlled. I can't do it on my own. I, I really want to. I'm like Paul in Romans 7 and 8. I, what I want to do, I don't do. But, but what I want to do only through Jesus, only through Holy Spirit can occur. So I'm going to encourage you to remember the example of Jesus in the temple. And I want you to try to incorporate those principles in your life. Identify who or what you are angry with and why. Jesus knew who he was angry with in the, when he went into the temple. They were using God's house for an improper purpose. Number two, take a non-threatening object in hand. Jesus took a whip. And he weaved that whip, and he took it in his hand. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Pause until you determine what you will do and say. Pause. He took the time to weave the whip, and that pause allowed him to calculate, what, what should I do here? Daddy, what, what do you want me to do here? Don't do physical or emotional harm to others. That's not God's way to deal with our anger. He's saying, give food to your neighbor who's hungry. Move on to ministry and redemption. Every single time that Jesus expressed something along the line of anger, he immediately moved on 
with his disciples to redeeming other people. Move on to ministry and redemption. Don't repress your anger. If you take anything home today, don't repress your anger. When you are angry, admit it, acknowledge it, and deal with it. Don't repress it. You can rely on this truth. God always promises to provide a way of escape from the temptation to act out of your anger. Read 1 Corinthians 10, 12 through 13 in the Amplified. Therefore, let the one who thinks he stands firm, immune to temptation, being overconfident and self-righteous, take care that he does not fall into sin and condemnation. No temptation, regardless of its source, has overtaken or enticed you that is not common to human experience, nor is any temptation unusual or beyond human resistance. But God is faithful to his word. He is compassionate and trustworthy. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to resist. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to resist. But along with the temptation, he has in the past and is now and will always provide the way out as well so that you will be able to endure it without yielding and will overcome temptation with joy. You can't be joyful and angry. You can overcome the temptation with joy. He provides the way of escape. But what do you have to do? You have to look for the way of escape and listen for the way of escape. It's there. Are you looking for it so that your anger isn't played out? So you may have to forgive me for this, but um, two weeks ago, we do food center. And by the way, Miss Kathy's here. We need volunteers for food center, please. Uh, some of you think about that. We need some people to pick up. We need people on Thursday to help us distribute. We're, we're feeding, uh, the, the Bethel Food Center is feeding almost 100 families every week, people <coughs> that don't have food. But um, we were out front and, and we were distributing and a car came by and a lady came out open the tailgate and, and I'm getting ready to put food in and as I'm getting ready to put food in the back of her uh, SUV, this, her son, I mean, Marshall's big, this guy was bigger than Marshall and I was kind of stunned and uh, he, he comes around the back and as I'm putting the, the baskets, the, the boxes in the back, he starts going through the food and he says, we don't like this, we, we won't eat this. Uh, don't give us that. And I, I don't know. <laughs> I got angry. <laughs> Sorry, Miss Kathy. I mean, it went all over me. I just, and John, fortunately, John and Doug were standing there. And I, John saw the look on my face. And he walked over and he said, I've got this. Well, what I had to do, I had to pause. Why am I angry? Well, we're trying to do something good for somebody and they, and they don't really appreciate it. But you know the awning out there that, that, that we built? I went over and I just, I took my, I put my hand on the wooden post. It was my grounding. And I just said, Lord, forgive me. And so they got back in the car and and John and Doug were able to deal with it but but it's just an everyday event but if I had just acted like nothing happened that I might have taken that out on, on Pam at home that night I might have taken it out on somebody else you, you got to acknowledge it and be able to deal with it and we'll talk about those steps of dealing in just a moment Satan came to steal, kill, and destroy. Those are all angry attitudes. He doesn't want you to act out of the fruit of the Spirit. He doesn't want you to have self-control. He wants you to be angry, and he wants you to act out of your anger. He doesn't want you to listen and look for the way of escape that God promises. He is angry, and he wants you to be angry. 
Don't repress your anger. The plan for dealing with your anger does not involve repressing it. Many of you have been taught to repress your anger. You were taught as kids, don't be angry. And you, you, so you learn to repress it and then you act it out on it. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 in the Living Bible. I know I read this before, but uh, this is from the Living Bible. If you are angry, don't sin by nursing your grudge. Don't repress it. Don't let the sun go down with you still angry. Get over it quickly. Deal with it. For when you are angry, you give a mighty foothold to the devil. And Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plan. Amen. So take your little sheets out. you got to have a plan. Okay? Please, everybody, glance at your little handout. Thank you, Travis, for printing these for us. So in, in my book, the acronym for dealing with your anger comes from Jesus' interaction at the well. If you watch The Chosen, the, the last episode of, of The Chosen where Jesus meets the woman at the well, <laughs> you got to watch it. It's on Netflix. I'm not pushing Netflix, but the, it, it's a great, it's a great um, uh, episode to watch. But the, the woman at the well... And the well stands for whenever you get angry, I'm asking you go to the well. The W stands for don't fly off the handle, wait. Wait, don't react before thinking. Unless your life or the lives of those around you is threatened, wait, pause, consider. So wait, W. The E stands for evaluate the situation. Why am I angry? Who am I really angry with? Um, am I falsely attacking someone or getting ready to? So number one, wait. And in that waiting time, evaluate the situation. I had to evaluate why I was getting angry outside. Number three, the L in well is listen. The voice of Holy Spirit is not going to be an angry, booming voice. It's going to be a still, small voice saying to you, David, don't do this, do this. Learn to listen to that voice. Why am I in this situation? Is my anger justified? What would you have me do here? And this takes practice. You can't recognize the voice of Holy Spirit unless you learn to listen to the voice of Holy Spirit. You've got to, ta you've got to practice doing that. And then the L, look for ways to resolve your anger appropriately. Don't repress it. Wait, evaluate, listen, and look. He promises a way of escape, but you've got to look for it. Now, sometimes there are people who need professional help in dealing with their anger. They have an anger uh, addiction. They, uh, they need that help. Don't hesitate to recommend that. But if you will start going to the well, then I think you will find that your anger can be dealt with. On the cover of our book, Simmering Anger, Smoldering Rage, I don't know whether they have that or not, but um, it, it's a, a geyser. And so it's a, it's a spring, yeah. So it's a hot spring. I don't know whether you've been to Yellowstone or not, but it, it's a hot springs down at the bottom. And then when, when that magma, which is molten rock, when it gets to a high enough temperature, all of a sudden it erupts into a geyser. That's what we want to deal with is, is our anger down here at the smoldering rock level and don't let it erupt into a geyser. Almost all of the, the prisoners that I interviewed said, I, I couldn't control it. It erupted. And when a geyser erupts, it pours out on other people. It's not just you that's damaged by the geyser. Monty's affected by my geyser. James is affected when it erupts. And that's what we need to prevent. 
I want to talk just for a moment as we con conclude about dealing with anger with your children and your, and your youth because this is a very special group and we don't want them growing up being angry young people. The first thing you need to do is to separate your child from the source of their anger. These are steps that you need to deliberately take and may not have been taken with you when you were growing up. Separate your child from the source of their anger. Allow them some time to calm down. Don't say to them, don't be angry. You're demonstrating anger yourself, okay? Allow them time to calm down. Number three, insist, ask them to express verbally what angered them and then voice understanding. I can understand why you would be angry with that. Or if it's not understandable, then you help to explain that. But make them express to you why they're angry so they will recognize it. Number four, use a grounding technique. Back to Jesus, whip. Back to me out there, grist me. Uh, road rage, I'm sorry, but Pastor Marion and I both kind of deal with a little bit of road rage at times. Uh, and my wife, she's been very, very uh, encouraging to me. But I have learned that the gear shift right here beside me, that's my grounding technique now for, for road rage. And so when I feel it coming and she says, honey, I just grab it. I just put my hand on it. And there's, there's an aspect of grounding that uh, is, is a well-written uh, physiologic, uh, psychological technique that you, you so the, the bet thing I would suggest you do if your kids are sitting is have them just put their hands on their knees. Let them ground there. There's benefit in grounding. Number five, encourage them to explain how being angry made them feel. How did it make you... Did I, were you excited? Did it make you feel good, make you feel bad? And teach them to make amends and offer forgiveness. In Luke 6, Jesus said, Listen, all of you, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, pray for the happiness of those who curse you, implore God's blessing on those who hurt you. What we have found, and especially my sons, is that incorporating this, now their kids come to them and say, Daddy or Mommy, I, 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 need, I need to deal with this. They're, they're coming even before they're being brought to that place and saying, I want to deal with my anger up front. So help them to identify it, not repress it, use grounding techniques, and help them to learn to offer forgiveness. If we're going to be difference makers in this world, we're going to have to deal with our anger. We can't call it righteous indignation. Let your righteous indignation become a stimulus for righteous living. Jesus said, let me tell you why you are here. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of the earth. If you love your saltiness, I'm sorry, if you lose your saltiness, how will people taste goodness, godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing our God colors into the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you on there, there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, the generous Father in heaven. Don't repress your anger. Deal with it in a God-pleasing fashion. Who had better excuses to be angry than Jesus. I mean, he was betrayed. He was falsely accused. He was abused physically, emotionally. But what were the words that Jesus said when he returned to his disciples after resurrection? Go out and get them. Listen, they're over here. I want you to, peace be with you. Jesus said, peace be with you. 
don't carry this anger. Don't, don't take this out, what they've done to me, on other people. You have choices to make. Will you be angry or joyful? Will you repress your anger or admit it and deal with it? Will you live without boundaries or demonstrate self-control? Will you live a life of violence and rage or of peace and contentment? Folks, don't choose temporary satisfaction over permanent fulfillment. Amen. Permanent fulfillment is joy. Temporary satisfaction is anger. Choose the supernatural lifestyle of dealing with what is a normal emotion, anger. Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep in perfect and constant peace the one whose mind is steadfast, that is committed and focused on you in both inclination and character because he trusts and takes a refuge in you with hope and confident expectation. You need to bring the anger that you have out of the recesses of your mind. Some of you have stored anger for a long time. Please don't leave here today with that still repressed in the back of your minds. Amen. Bring it out. Deal with it. Let those who are trained to help you deal with it. As Caleb sang earlier today, lay it at the foot of the cross. That's where Jesus wants it, at the foot of the cross, where his blood covers your sin, but it also enables you by the power of Holy Spirit who he's promised to give us, living in us, to deal with it so that you won't keep acting out in anger and rage.